Hey everybody, good morning. This is Anne. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host and disembodied voice, Justin, who is currently um, doing surgery on a computer. So he's not in my, well, he's not in my ear and he's not on the stream. So the disembodied voice is present in, in a ghostly fashion in the truest sense of the word right now. Um, I hate to, I hate to disappoint you, Kroniko, but guys, today is the last stand of the Scottish heroine. If I cannot, if I do not like this model by the end of the day, I'm trashing it. I'm trashing it. Um, I don't like the plaid. I don't like how it's turning out and I'm just not enjoying myself. So if I don't like it, I'm going to toss it and we'll work on something else. Um, so, so sadly, sadly, nothing against Scottishness, everything against the way this model is working right now. Um, and this happens, guys. It happens to me. It happens to, like, everybody, even the best painters in the world have, like, days where they're, like, working on something and they thought it was a great idea, and then they just hate it. So they just stop working on it. Yeah. Yep, yep. So I'm going to try to redeem it. I'm going to try to essentially do a small section that I actually like. If I can make a small, small section work that I actually like, then I will attempt to continue with it. Otherwise, boom, off she goes and we'll work on something, I don't know, a metallic dwarf. Why not? Hey, Agent Marvel, how's it going? Hey, everybody. Yes, you, you came in in the middle of my rant. I'm, I'm a, I, I think I didn't get, I haven't checked my Fitbit, but I think I didn't get great sleep last night. I'm a little bit grouchy today. And I just like woke up and looked at this model and was like, not this again. <laughs> it happens. It happens to international award-winning painters. Guess what? It's not just you. It's not just your shelf of shame. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what, Mo? If it's, if it's just not working and you don't like it and you're not having fun, boop. I don't, I don't know if I'll throw her in the trash. I might prime her, again, prime her over and maybe do something down the road. Hey there, Bob and Julie. Don't worry, it's not your model I'm throwing out. It's Bobby's. <laughs> I'm in that mood. I'm in that mood, guys. Just beware. Yes, I'm not Abby, Val. It's okay. Fingers. Morning. Caffeine. Grumpies. Whatever. Wednesday. <laughs> Oh my God, guys. It's, it's one of those days where you wake up and you're just like, oh, this again. <laughs> and I should never have one of those days. But you know what? Even though you feel like you should never, even if your life is awesome and you feel like you should never have one of those days, you still do, right? You still do. It's human. Hello, everybody. You'll take her, Kurniko. Yeah, I just, yeah, I don't like how heavy the green is getting. Like when it gets compressed up here, even though I know that it should look that way, because of the way the cape is going, I still don't like how it looks. And so I'm frustrated with it. Had I been uh, a smarter Anne, I would have not attempted to go quite so small with the tartan. I would have gone larger with it. It would have been easier, faster. It wouldn't have taken up so much time. We wouldn't have all this angst. But um, yeah, thanks for the cutie face, Val. Groundhog Day is historically my worst day of creation. Like, as far as, like, the number of momentous and soul-crushing things that have happened to me on Groundhog Day. Yeah, I had three years in a row of terrible Groundhog Days. So, it has gone down in history as my worst day ever. So, even more than the movie. Even more than the movie. Hey, Trouble. Oh, it's your sub -aversary. Happy sub -aversary. Happy sub -aversary. Trouble. Oh, yeah, you can relate. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, when you just don't love it, you know, you've got to do it and you just don't love it. And you're like, can we just start over? <laughs> but you put all this time into it, especially when it's greens, right? If, if this was a commission, it would be worse, right? Then it would be like, ugh, then I would have to do it, you know, and, and finish it, even though I didn't like it. And that's the worst feeling. Even if your client likes it or your client's like, ah, it's fine. You know, you know how you feel about it. So, yeah. There are 364 other days in a year. This is good. This is good. Three months back in the hobby. Great. Hill. Hilloth. 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 Ooh. Are you howling? Or are you just zeroing? <laughs> and of course, Twisted Oma. Jumping in with the 17. The 17 month of sub. Yes. Good day. Good day. See, I don't agree. I don't like it, Inara. I never strip minis, Chia. I throw them out. Or I prime them over. I never strip. I really feel like it's not worth the pain. Like, I use really thin paint. I can easily prime this over and not cover up any detail. 
Hey, VCR. Good to see you. Zeros. All right. So it's not a, a wolf. Not a wolf howl. It's actually zeros. Goose eggs. Got it. But yeah. So um, yeah. So we're we're gonna work on it. But uh, yeah, be aware. Anne's angst level is rising. And if I do not like it by the end of today, I'm going to toss the mini. Sometimes when I really hate a model, like I may just paint over this one. That's one thing is I don't have to prime over everything. I could just paint white over the entire cape and start again and go from there. Oh, good. Excellent trouble. I'm glad that you learned a lot and I'm glad that it helped you paint your gulper. I don't care about tradition, so I doubt that that's it, Jabberwock. Actually, not true, Crowley, if you remember my stripey dress from Juliana, and I loved that. In fact, I just painted stripes on a model last night and then hated it, so I painted over it. I've been having a 24 hours with painting. Eh, it's not, it, it's not, I don't know. I've done plaid before, though, Hiloth. I've done plaid. I just, you know, usually do it on bigger models, because I think it works better. Um, I don't think so, Inara. I don't know. Believe me, I have seen the ugly stick phase. I normally get to avoid it because my uh, my technique of painting where I'm painting one thing and then finishing it usually saves me from the ugly stick. Uh, pardon me while I put some void blue down here. But, um, but really, it doesn't matter. Like, you know what? Because if you don't like it, you don't need to paint it. That's, that's the philosophy of today's show, guys. You can try to placate me, but when I look at the model, when I wake up and walk in here and look at that model and go, oh, I don't want that. I don't want to come to the show that way. I want to come to the show going, yeah, we're going to do this today. This will be fun. I'm looking forward to sharing it with all my Twitch friends. You know, I want that. <laughs> I don't want, <laughs> I don't want that face. I don't want that little kid looking at carrots face. <laughs> Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I was a 2D artist first, actually, Hiloth. So I, uh, I can draw, uh, and sketch and do things like that. So freehand is actually kind of my thing. Um, although I'm not doing a lot of it right now, but yeah, it's not, it's not a, like that I'm doing it wrong. It's just that I don't like it. Like, I don't like how much the green has gotten into it. I don't like, I'm going to try to do the yellow stripe on part of this and see if one, if I can even do it because the green stripes are so thin. Um, and two, if it, if it comes off well, uh, because when you start doing really tiny stripes on top of tiny stripes on top of tiny stripes, sometimes, uh, at this scale, it just won't look right. So I do need to first put in the lighter yellow. I mean, I did these black lines kind of bridging on the tartan down here, but I, I don't like how it looks. To me, putting those black lines um, or dark lines, I guess I used a dark blue, uh, around the edges to try to bring some of the blue back and minimize the green, that actually just makes it look more like a checkerboard to me and less like a plaid. So yeah, yeah, I used to do canvas a long time ago. Long time ago in galaxies far, far away, but I learned a lot more from mini painting. I learned more about painting from painting miniatures than I ever learned in art school, ever. Which is both a testament to the awfulness of my art school and, <laughs> and a testament to the fact that you don't need to go to college to be a good anything. Well, okay, maybe to be a good doctor, right? There are certain things that college is good for, but not art. Art To be a good artist or a good writer, I do not believe you need a college course. You need to be like dedicated, right? You need to have your own self-motivation, but if you're interested in it, you can teach yourself. Alrighty, I'm going to put down some white first. I'm going to try, I'm going to get my cat's eye green out and block in the rest of this white stuff. I'm going to get it uh, to a point where then I can give it a chance. I did determine that I didn't use cat's eye, but use Naga or something, but I don't care. <laughs> like... All right, Highland Heron. And, and I will say this is not like a, a, a diss on the sculpt at all, much as I made that Bobby Jackson joke when Bobby Julie came in. Um, it, the sculpt's fine. It's just that I, I got uh, two, I think my scaling is just off. I've got two uh, small scale. Decided not, not to be large scale on it. Oh no, not twitchy twitch. It's that day. It's just that day, guys. Although I, I am thankful for living in California today when I saw what the weather was in Washington, D.C. With like below freezing wind chills and super windy. I was like, oh dear. 
I remember that from Wisconsin. I'm really glad that I live here. So I am thankful for one thing today. I am thankful for the weather. That means that I can go for a walk and we'll be in the 60s. Yeah, but it's, you know, that's, and that's, that's, that on small areas, that makes sense, right? As long as it looks okay. It's not really what I set out to do. When I, when I do tartan, I want to do it for reals. But, uh, <laughs> Link, yes, I got what you meant. Oh, did they? I think that's funny. It's like, thanks for bringing snow to the inauguration. <laughs> We're not supposed to talk about politics, and Justin isn't here to rein us in, so we have to not talk about the inauguration. But I, I the D.C. weather is, is okay to talk about. Because I did actually live north of D.C. I lived up north of Baltimore um, for a year when I was freelancing. And uh, I was lucky. It was a mild winter. The year after I left, they got like two feet of snow dumped on them. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just don't care at this point, right? Kind of just don't care. I like her red hair. I really like how the red hair turned out. So I may just paint white all over this. The, the fact that I'm showing you how to do it though. I mean, this is the way I would do it guys. Just because I, uh, just because I don't like the result. Doesn't mean that the technique isn't valid. Although I do feel, like I said, I do feel that I went, um, that it's just out of scale. I tried to go too, too in scale for the scale, um, which is there is a point of diminishing returns when you are at a small scale where you can overcomplicate. And that's what I feel I did is I chose too complicated a pattern for the surface. And that's something to keep in mind when you're doing freehand uh, because every, every freehand, potential freehand surface is different. And uh, you can really get in trouble by going too large or too small scale with freehand patterns on, on smaller or complicated areas. So when you are designing a freehand pattern for something, one thing to do is to consider really uh, how well it will suit the area if you'll be able to carry off the design in the space that you have. This is especially true if you've got an area with a lot of folds on it. Oh, which brushes did you get, Kariniko? Yeah, it was windy here yesterday. Flurries. Snowing, huh? Yeah, I do I do miss snow. Like, I kind of liked North Texas because despite the heat in the summer, like, it still would get cold enough to get a little bit of snow in the winter. But if I want snow here, we have to drive up to the mountains. And, of course, this year that's not happening. We're, uh, we're all on the, the travel barred. David didn't even go skiing this year, and David is rabid about skiing. He was super jealous of his dad for going. Um, Hyper Bunny, yeah. I mean, the problem with Tartan, as I'm illustrating here, it, if you do it, do it like double the size that I did it here. It's kind of, it's not realistic, but at least you can get the Tartan on there. When you do something this small, like I'm about to attempt to put really thin yellow lines down the middle of each of these green stripes after I block in some, I need to block in that lighter green first. So let me reach for my lemon yellow. And uh, apparently there's something in the air today. Pardon me while I blow my nose because I am a little sniffly this morning. But since it was so windy, that doesn't really surprise me. There's gunk that gets in the air out here that really hits my sinuses. One moment. Uh just don't want to sniffle at all y'all on camera. All right. Yay. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, Rosemary makes a good uh, a good product. I hear. They may not be for me, but they are totally uh, people really like their brushes in general. So, and a brush company that produces things like Kalinsky Sables does tend to make a higher quality synthetic when they make a synthetic. So hopefully that works for you. All right. So I'm mixing in some of my green with a couple of drops of lemon yellow because I need to make the lighter green um, square that happens when the two greens, uh, green, when the two green lines cross over. Grab some water. 
just drop it in. I'm going to go about a two to one. So I want another drop of water, drop it in. You want it to be solid enough to cover decently, but you need it to flow off your brush pretty precisely. So it needs to be that kind of um, compromise. Oh, wow. Declare man. Yeah, I actually have always had allergies. Actually, I have pet allergies, but that has never stopped me from owning pets before. Um, pets and mold are apparently, I think. Uh, sometimes dust, certain amounts of, like, I'll get very sneezy with a lot of dust in the air, but I think most people do that. It's just irritated sinuses. So let's get in focus and there. There was a Kalinsky ban a long time ago, Chibi. Several years ago now. Uh, somebody in the the um, Fish and Wildlife Service got their undies in a bundle about the weasel brushes and uh, essentially got the government to ban them. Then Russia pretty much provided documentation that Kalinskis are nuisance animals and horrible predators in the wild, which is true. And so they were not, you know, like killing an endangered species, etc., etc., etc. All right, so that's too thin because I cannot see it. So that means I went over the top. It means I've got to put another drop of lemon yellow in and a drop of green and uh, make my thing a little bit more. Yeah, and then, so essentially, uh, then the Kalinsky ban was lifted. Ta-da. Yeah, don't feel too bad for the Kalinsky sables. Um, sables and weasels are murderous little animals. Many of them kill, apparently, for the joy of killing rather than to eat. So I don't feel bad for them. Right. Well, some weasels and ferrets and things are endangered, right? So I could see that there would be a ban on those, but apparently Kalinskis breed really super fast and they're everywhere. There we go. That's, a little, that's more solid. So we want those solid squares, which down here I lined around, but I don't really like the look of that. I'm not getting, the other problem with having this be so small though, is that without those lines, I'm not getting really clean edges. Like, okay, if I did this tartan twice this size, guys, I would be able to, you would be able to see the very clean edges around these little um, lighter green checkers that I'm doing. But this is another problem with the scale. Because it's so small, remember you need high contrast to see details. That also applies to your freehand patterns. So without doing this little lining around each of these tartan squares, which is not proper uh, for the tartan, I can't get that delineation so that you can see those lighter squares very well. Yeah, weasels are known for being little murder muffins. Um, I mean, they are really cute, but they're bloodthirsty little buggers. There are lots of stories of weasels breaking into, like, hen houses and just killing every bird in there. And not eating them. Just killing them. Now, given I have not checked up on the, you know, the scientific facts about this. So, you know, if you wish to research weasel psychology, um, feel free if you wish to correct me. but I think they're little psychopaths. I do like ferrets. I always liked ferrets. I was just sad that ferrets were stinky. Kind of like I'm sad that domesticated foxes are stinky. Like otherwise I would probably want one. All right, so you can see the lighter squares there. So I'm gonna keep going on this and uh, essentially block it in. We're once again gonna use this fold for a test. But yeah, don't, don't be surprised if our sexy Highland heroine gets uh, supplanted by a dark dwarf for uh, next week. But you guys should be happy if that happens, because you can watch me do metallics. I'll do all metallics on the dwarf. In fact, I chose him for that specific reason. I may do a little bit of the re-sculpt on the beard, because I don't like it very much. But Or maybe we'll just paint over it. Maybe we'll use paint plastic surgery. Wow. 
Yeah, I wouldn't have a dog to keep it outside. I just don't like, I don't, I, I mean, my grandparents always did, but I always felt kind of sad because the dogs that, that my grandparents got were like really social, human, so he, human-centered dogs. Like they got collie German Shepherd mixes. Um, and it just always made me sad because the dog really wanted to be with the people, but they chained it outside in the doghouse. So I don't really like it. That's just me, though. That and I saw people in Texas, even though there were laws against it, really abuse it. When you see somebody who owns a chow chow having it out, staked out on a leash in the middle of Texas summer, you get kind of a um, aversion to the whole keep your dog outside thing. I do realize that there are plenty of like good ways to keep dogs outside, and even plenty of dog breeds that enjoy it. But, I don't know, my experience has not been great, so personally I'm... Personally, I'm for, uh, if I have a dog, it's going to be an indoor dog. Your mileage may vary. So putting in those little light, little light links. Yeah, big fluffy dog in 108 degrees, right? Yeah. They obviously acclimated, but it was just, yeah, I don't know. I don't get people sometimes. Why even own dogs? Ours, these were not nice dogs because they also, I think the, uh, I, I suspect the person just kept them as watchdogs, quote unquote, um, because they didn't socialize them and they were very fence aggressive and they were never out there to, I never, ever saw them training the dogs ever. And I was out in my backyard a lot in the old house, but I, I mean, I had a friend who had a very, very nice black chow. He was even good with kids, which is, you know, a feat. Of course, he grew up with them, so that would make sense. But yeah, in general, I like indoor dogs. If I'm going to have a dog, I want a dog to interact with and train. Not just to have around as an accessory. Or as a glorified burglar alarm. Although, I mean, the dogs definitely made me feel better about being alone. Back when I was married and had a husband who traveled every week. So there was that. But I still wanted them in the house with me. <laughs> they are big floofs. I am not looking for floof. Like, I have owned floof now because Leo was incredibly floofy for a Shiloh. Like, he had a lot of coat. Um, and I, I just never want that again. <laughs> I'm a smooth coat girl. I like the traditional um, shorter coat. For Shilohs. I'm, I'm a rarity because most people like the, the fancy, super floofy, uh, you know, showstopper type coat. But I definitely have turned into a... I want enough fur so that it's fun to pet. Like, my, I grew up with German short hair pointers, and that's too short. But, um, like, a short double coat I, I enjoy. Yeah, exactly, Sean. That's why that's why I'm complaining about it. <laughs> I'm complaining about this model because this is too much pattern for the scale. Um, I decided I wanted to try to do it anyway because people had asked about tartan patterns, and so I decided this would be one to try. But yeah, it does need... Uh, no, I've already... Actually, Sean Ald, you came in late. I already... I started off this whole video by saying that if I didn't like this model by the end of the video, I was tossing it and we're putting in something else. Um, and then I've been talking about the scale, the problems with the scale and things like that. So let's see, you know, the other thing I can do, I can add a little shading. I'm going to use my void blue and thin it down to glaze level. <laughs> I like dobies. I'm, I'm very sad about the heart issue that they have. Kind of similar to an issue that's in our breed. So I'm going to put a little bit of a glaze of void blue to try to um, get just a little bit of shading in here too, where the folds are. And that'll help to kind of knock that green down a little bit. But yeah, the key with 28 millimeter tartan is usually you've got to simplify it a great deal. And I'm trying to 
I don't know. I'm going to try that, that stripe. But if the stripe doesn't work, then we're going to go back to the... Actually, I've been looking at Australian cattle dogs. They seem like nice dogs. I like some aspects of their personalities. But Shilohs are still the breed for me. It's just that, you know, if I had to get a smaller dog, like if I was getting older, well, I am getting older, but you know. So I'm just reinforcing my uh, lighter, lighter dots. Not been a fan. We've got a really nice one here in the uh, compound. I mean, they're not they're not generally friendly to strangers, Crowley, but I don't require that in a dog. I uh, I actually am pretty happy with a more aloof dog. Kiri was not a dog that was like all over strangers. Like she was very she was reserved, and I actually like that temperament a bit. All right, we're going to try to put a yellow stripe through this. It's probably going to backfire. We probably are going to create something terrible. We'll probably wipe out our green, but we're going to try it. Yeah, well, there are a lot of those dogs in need of homes. I rescued my first animals. But uh, since I'm very invested in responsible breeding, I am uh, likely to get another Shiloh because I know I can trust the breeding program and the breeders. All right, so that's a really, really bloody thin line. Really thin. See how thin that is? So, and this is with the big brush because I wanted it to, I, I'm not doing, because I'm doing a longer line, I didn't want to switch to my tiny brush because the tiny brush might've run out of paint like three quarters of the way through. This is a little bit more dicey, but if I keep very little paint on my brush, I can control it. So the really important thing here is unloading your brush to make sure you've got very little paint on it. If you have any more paint than is necessary for it to stay wet, you will come run into catastrophe. That's a little thicker there. And notice I'm doing my little dashes again. When you're doing a, a quote unquote straight line, doing little dashes is perfectly permissible. Nobody expects you to uh, do anything. Yeah, I like, uh, I looked at Valhuns because I've always liked them, and also they have Kiri's face, like the markings they have as Kiri. Um, but they apparently, uh, have a really shrill, awful bark that sometimes makes people, like, really put their teeth on edge. So, we're in an apartment right now, so that's a no. <laughs> also, they are a barky breed. Yeah, no, Zeke, that's actually um, one of Kiri's babies, uh, Jax, from Kiri's first litter with Leo. One of Kiri's babies was like that. They called him the Yeti, his, his owners. Because he would go outside and he would totally, he had, he had Leo's big coat, and he would not want to come in. So I totally, and I mean, Shiloh's had Malamute in him way back, so not surprising. That's cool. Yeah, Valhans are a pain to find in the U.S. They are ex because there are so few breeders. They are expensive. They also have population problems. I read something about their genetic diversity not being great in Europe. A lot of the smaller breeds get into trouble that way if they don't watch it and their gene pool shrinks too much. I mean, that's what we're do we're working with with Shilohs right now. So there we go. So we've got some little tiny lines now. It's it's kind of looking more tartany. But yeah, my first cat who I loved more than life itself, uh, my first animal that I personally owned was a rescue. Actually, all my cats have been technically rescues.
that said, I really do think we need to like move toward really responsible breeding in this country. If people are going to breed, like I, I, I hear all the regulations that my friends in Europe have to like go through all the hoops they have to jump through to be breeders in Europe. And I'm like, I kind of wish there was a program like that here in the USA, although it would probably fail just because people would say it impinged on their personal freedoms. I don't know. It's a shame sometimes. Yeah, Bernice Mountain Dog. Yep, they're nice dogs. Yeah, well, that would, that's a rescue, no bad, in my opinion. That is a rescue, because those kittens would either end up feral or they'd end up at the pound. Yeah, Valhons are, are adorable. You, do you see what I mean about them having the Kiri markings? They've got the mask and the little light eyebrows. So I've always liked their look. But, uh, but apparently, yes, a very, very, a barky breed and it have a very high shrill bark. So great watchdogs, but, uh, bad for apartment living. check it on you guys. I'm going to try to do the stripe through this area where I did the black bars, which I may yet rescind, or the dark blue bars, rather. I think I used blue liner. So this is a white line. Technically, it should be a yellow line. So if I want it to uh, work, I'm going to have to glaze it with yellow. But I don't have to be like, I'm not like super like going to get into highlighting and shading something this tiny. It's not going to matter. So I just need it to look more yellow than white. But I start out with the white because yellow always covers better over white. And since this is so tiny, you really need to just start it with white so to make sure that it looks yellow at all and that it covers it all. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I was, uh, right after I lost Kiri, I was like, I could, I could tell, like, it was weird. I've never had this before where I immediately wanted another animal. Um, she just left a big void. So I was researching other breeds, um, because in this apartment, uh, like I had a hard time getting Kiri accepted in this apartment because they have stuff against shepherds. Um, essentially I had my old vet write that she wasn't a GSD mix, so they couldn't like have a problem with it. But I don't have that recourse with a new animal, so if I had wanted, I've, I've come down from there since then. You know, a little bit of time, deep breaths, don't need a dog right away, you know. So I am still looking. But the other, the other thing when I started looking is the problem is, who do you trust? Like, this is the problem I had with when um, Zach and I used to, were first looking at dogs. And we wanted a German Shepherd, but you really need to find a breeder you can trust as far as health testing and everything. And it's like trying to figure out who's a good breeder is really difficult when you don't know the community. Um, so it comes back to Shiloh's because I just, I trust these people so much. I know their hearts are in the right places. Because I've worked with them for over a decade. All right, so we've got this gridded out horizontally. Now we have to grid it out vertically. Yeah. Yeah, magnetic gumby. Yeah, yeah, because some breeders just don't. <sighs> There's so much science out there. Now, in breeders, between seven weeks and 10 weeks is the window, right? But. I mean, you also have to like, I don't know, and it varies by the breed, so I can't say, but but some breeders just seem to send their puppies home really early. I mean, there's so much that can contribute to separation anxiety as well. You just never know. I mean, it could also be a feature of the dog. Like, just like people, some dogs are more anxious. Okay, we're going to try the vertical, guys. This is going to be hard. Yeah, so it also, it might not even be like a, 
like a early parental separation sometimes, but sometimes you just get a dog that's more anxious. We know this because we do temperament testing on every one of our puppies, like in my organization, every breeder, every litter. Um, so we see this. We see puppies that are more anxious and less confident. And those are the dogs that are more likely to get that sort of issue, an anxiety-related issue. So, But a lot of breeders don't believe that early temperament testing works, and I would very much disagree. <laughs> if a cool for Ann equals impossible for mere mortals. Maybe not, cool pack. Maybe not. Um, also a large coward. <laughs> yeah, which breed is it, Otter Mama? Uh, yeah, I need to thin that just a little bit more. Oh, geez. Geez, really, Auto Mod? I get it, but... Oh, Cannon Dog. Yes, I've heard really good, really good stuff about your breed, actually, Otter Mama. Yeah, I think some of the smaller breeds, you're, you're better off sometimes because the breeders tend to have to manage a little bit better. That's not always the case. I feel like now I went too thin. Okay, so to get your white to, to do this, to get these super thin lines, you really need, like, the perfect consistency. And if you feel like you've gone too far over one way or the other, then if you're too thick, it's not going to come off your brush like it was just doing with me. But then I think I dumped some water into it, and now I think it's too thin, so I added just one more drop of white. This is really, when you're doing this really fine work, you've got to nail your paint consistency super, super well, and make sure you unload your brush correctly. Oh, no. Yeah, that's how I've heard about cattle dogs, too. Is this, It's not a breed for everybody. It has a lot of drive. It has a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it is suspicious towards strangers. There's things you got to know. I think with any breed, that's what re where the research comes in, right? you got to know what you want uh, as a dog owner and uh, kind of, like, look at the characteristics and see what uh, you're able to handle. You know, like, as far as if this problem comes up, can I handle it? That kind of thing. I learned a lot from our Shilohs because we had so many different temperaments and energy levels and drives. And I did own a reactive dog. One of our Shilohs was reactive. So I learned a lot from that dog. All right, vertical stripe. Let's go. I'm going to start in the middle because up here it's too narrow. I might not be able to carry it up all the way. It's going to gonna be real dicey down the middle of this. That top part was dirty, but this is clean. That's clean. Little dashes. That's clean. So brush control, you need for this. And you get brush control by painting. Paint more. Paint lines. So we've got a vertical stripe. This is where too much for the scale really kicks in. Yes, it's true, Sean. Although I'm liking it better now than I was. Oh, independent and really smart. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's actually a similar to cattle dogs. Um, how biddable or not biddable, i.e. how independent or not independent a dog is, really does have a, a big effect. You've got to really convince them that they want to do what you want them to do as far as training. But if you can engage them, then they learn super quick. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like my kind of breed, actually. I will admit that I uh, I like a smart dog, even if the smart dog is a little bit uh, independent. When I'm doing puppy evaluations and the puppy looks at the tester and like picks up the toy and just kind of goes, I'm going to go take this over here in the corner. Screw you. I tend to laugh. <laughs> the tester's like, oh, <laughs> and I'm like, he, 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 I like that puppy. <laughs> so I do like the little spitfires, I'm afraid. Yeah, there are very few cannon dogs. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, as far as magnetic gumby, could the vertical stripes be horizontal if you turn the mini sideways? I.e., could you, could you get a better, you know, could you paint it easier? Um, you notice that when I painted these, I actually did turn the mini sideways to paint it. And that's because my comfortable stroke for this sort of thing is a vertical stroke. So also pay attention when you're painting. Like, a lot of my blending, I'm actually working on a sideways stroke. 
Um, but when I'm doing like really fine detail, I tend to go vertical. I think I have a little bit better control of the brush when I do that. So when you are painting, as you practice little things like this, and I mean, periodically do, like uh, Strathmore makes little squares of watercolor paper and you can just like, you know, practice, doodle, do little designs on them. See how small you can get. That's how you get good at this stuff. It doesn't take too much either. Yeah, I uh, I looked at Aussies, but the fur is too long for me. Like I really am. Like I, I and I even know, and this is, is kind of sad too because I know a really good Aussie breeder. She's actually a miniature American Shepherd breeder, I should say. She she was one of the key people in getting the mini, what used to be the miniature Australian Shepherd, um, AKC recognized. But she is a very good breeder. We talked a lot when I was getting into Shiloh's. She used to come to pet expos that I was at, stuff like that. Um, so I. I think she's a, I have a high opinion of her, um, but I don't want coat. Like I used to love long coated dogs until I had to like keep them from matting. <sighs> then it just turned stressful. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason. Yes. Independent, but quick to train when convinced. Yes. And, and then you just need a bond with your dog, right? Like, you need to work on it. You need to work on bonding with your dog. So your dog thinks you're the best thing in the world. And then they'll, like, do anything. You can teach them anything. Kiri would do anything for me. Like, I want that in my next dog. Like, Kiri would, even if it was scary to her, if I asked her to do it, she would try. And then it becomes your responsibility to never ask your dog to do something that sets them up for failure. So it's a responsibility as a dog owner. I love the herding breeds in general for all of that. I, uh, I really feel like that human focused um, trainability, even when it comes with independence, I like it. Always have since I was a kid doing my 4-H dog project. All right, so now we're getting really, really, really tiny and we're getting really, really complicated. Yeah, you do have to vacuum daily, I believe it. Yeah, I think it sometimes it goes double for our animal friends. I think we wouldn't have as many problem dogs in the world if they trusted their owners, VCR. But so many people don't speak dog, right? They get dogs, but they don't really, like, learn how to communicate effectively with their dog. It does take effort. When I was a kid, I sucked at it. When I was in the dog project, my Sheltie would, like... He would do everything as long as I was on, you know, on the other end of the leash. But when we went... When we graduated from basic obedience and went off leash, it was all over. <laughs> He was like, yeah, you're a putz. I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm going to jump out of the ring and go eat this little kid's popcorn. He actually did that one year. At state. <laughs> state obedience <laughs> tournament. That's when you know your dog does not respect you. But, you know, he was technically my dad's dog. Like, he really, he really bonded with my dad. So the fact that I was taking him through obedience, he didn't give a crap. But that's where you know, like, you've just been owned. Because when I can get the German short-haired pointer to do a perfect run in obedience, but the Sheltie, you know, goes, screw you, and gives me the high sign and jumps out of the ring. That, that's where you know you failed. <laughs> Our GSP was fine with it. She just liked the attention, so she would do whatever. Also, German shirt-haired pointers tend to be pretty high drive, so, you know, it was a good channel for her. But yeah, Pippi scored higher... Like, her first year in obedience, she scored higher than F Fergie. Fergus was our uh, sh our Sheltie. Um, by a substantial margin. And I was like, maybe I was training the wrong dog. Alright, so we've got that. We just don't have that small line down there. Then I'm going to do yellow glaze. And I'm going to see. I mean, it's looking better up here. It's really tight and small, and it kind of, like, makes your eyeballs go bazonkers when you look at it. But it's not terrible. And let's see. What do I want to do? Do I want to fix this? I feel like I need to fix it a little bit. I feel like my stripes got too narrow. Part of that is the fact that the bottom of the cloak is really um, torn up. So maybe I should do some weathering down there first. And then decide to clean it up. 
So let's do that. Where is my shield brown and driftwood brown? My my awesome weathering colors. Do, do, do. There okay. is desert stones also good. There's shield brown. There's Driftwood. All right, so these two colors, although they are also wood colors and excellent wood colors, um, also make great uh, trail dust kind of colors. I'm just gonna actually muddy up the bottom of this cloak because I'm I'm getting frustrated with the fact that it's so uh, so worn, so holy and pitted, um, which is you know it's supposed to say that it's you know taken some damage over the and gotten worn down. The edge has fallen apart over the years. So I'm going to take it up on that uh, storyline and uh, put some weathering on it. So I want to thin these about two to one. Because I want it to, a little transparent. Because if it's dusty, it's not going to be like a solid dot. So what I want is really the appearance of kind of a dried, semi-dried muck. So you want to start with your lighter color first because that's a more of your dust color and that's going to be our driftwood, driftwood brown. Let's we'll see if I've made it thick enough. It should be okay. Two to one is about right for this. You want it a little transparent, but you don't because you don't want like just spots. If you have wet muck, if you have wet muck, then you do want globs and spots. But if you want a dusty effect, you want to kind of blend it in a little bit. So there's my shield brown and my driftwood, and that's the paint consistency you're there at. You can see that they are pretty, pretty solid, but a little bit transparent. See it where it's showing through there? All right, rinse out your brush, put this guy back. Yeah, I decided if I don't like the bottom of the cloak, the best thing I can do is paint over it with mud. Interesting. Yeah, Twisted Oma. The color inheritance in Goldens is interesting. Same with um, the Labrador. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's maybe a bit more um, uh, color variation in the la in the Golden than in the Lab. But yeah, the fashion lately is in these almost white dogs, which is you know really really uh, bleaching out the coloring. But I always liked a truly a golden golden to golden red. All right, so the dusty parts. We're just gonna kind of see. We're gonna stipple a lot. We're gonna build up layers of stippling. And then our darker brown, our shield brown, since that's that's meant to imply that it's more of a moist and actual actively mucky, um, we're gonna put that more toward the bottom. And as you can see, this is not like super opaque. Like I can still see my stripes and stuff through it a bit. Um, I'm just gonna do this and see if I like it. I am covering up what I feel is some of the most ugly uh, parts of the tartan. But I'm also letting some show through, right? So I'm not losing everything. And I'm gonna build up a heavier layer. In other words, I'm gonna keep stippling more toward the edge of the tartan. I wanna break up some of this stuff a little higher. So that it's like, but you can see then, you can now you can see the holes in the cape, right? Because I'm putting a solid layer down here. So you can see how it is uh, fraying toward the edge. If this was a bust, I would be able to actually suggest fraying cloth um, on that. Black and tan lab. Yeah, that would be a cross with something. Color color patterns and how they intersect, we're running into that now with our um, outcrosses because Shiloh's, at least our, our um, group of Shiloh's is outcrossing to different breeds to get more diversity and hopefully get rid of some of our genetic health issues or at least lower the incidence of them dramatically. And uh, so like we're getting from the um, poodle, poodle wetterhound mix we used, uh, we're getting the piebald gene and the dominant black and we have no, like the piebald is recessive. So we're unlikely to ever get panda shepherds, but um, but, uh, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how the, like the dominant black expresses. It'll be interesting to see how some of these white spotting genes express and stuff like that. I love genetics. So I'm just like kid in a candy store. All right. So now we're taking some shield brown. I'm going to darken down the edge down here. The darker you make your brown on the edge, although you never would go down to like black and brown, you would go down to like muddy brown, which is perfect. Or uh, maybe like muddy soil, which is a very dark brown. That's It's the dirt colors triad. Um, you could go down to muddy soil, but then you better have a lot of fresh mud on your base. 
So remember that, guys. Oh, yeah, Panda Shepherd. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, they took a shepherd and introduced something with the piebald gene and, and then bred on it to get that pattern, so. And probably then bred back to lions. And it, they're interesting. I hope that they're responsible breeders um, kind of guiding that. I always hope that with uh, with breeds that get popular or variations on breeds. But they're interesting looking. I'll give you that. All right, so darker toward the base. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what breed. They claimed it was a natural variation, but everybody's pretty sure that that's not the truth. Um, they would have had to inbreed on it to set it in if that was the case. But yeah, the they look interesting, those panda shepherds. And they seem, I mean, they seem very shepherdy with just a different color pattern, which is cool. I'm not a purist. I'm like... If that's what floats your boat, go for it. If it's a good dog, it's a good dog. All right. So whatever your weathering color is, guys, you should also use that on your basing because you want to really tie the fact that this is, you know, this is brushing the ground here and the ground is dirty. And so this has been adhering to the cape um, and that, that you'll sell that effect if you use that color on the basing. So now we've just got to kind of look at what we've got here. Thumb over the rest of it. And I ask myself, do I hate it still? I need some shading. Hey, Raccoon, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm an art, I'm an art geek, art nerd. I, was, I went to art school before I became a miniature painter of doom. Um, so yeah, I do talk. I talk. We haven't talked about color theory a lot on this stream, but we do tend to talk a lot about color theory and pigments and things like that. I've been talking more about paint consistency and stuff on this one because I've been doing little tiny lines. So now, and it's nice to meet you, Raccoon, by the way. I'm Anne. I work for Reaper remotely. I used to make their paint lines in person for about, uh, I worked for them in person for about 17 years. And then I moved out here to be with my awesome guy. And they very nicely kept me on to stream for them because Reaper is awesome. All right, so I've got these little white lines that really need to be little yellow lines. So let's try that. Where is my lantern yellow? You need a very strong yellowy yellow. Very, very strong yellowy yellow. Yellow. Even though this looks orangey, when the minute you thin it down, it's going to go more yellow. But if you use something pale, like if I used lemon, which you might immediately be tempted to use because it is the color you need, um, you would find that you would be disappointed because the smaller an area something takes up, the less the color shows. So in order to get a tiny detail to show as an intense color, you need to use a very intense color over the top of it. So we are going to use Lantern. I'm going to try it. I can always highlight it with a little bit of white where I feel like it would be um, in the light. So let's get a little bit more. There we go. All right, lantern. So I'm going to thin it down and I'm just really going to be glazing it. I'm going to be painting the lantern yellow over the top of the white stripes. And I don't really even need to glaze it. I just need to paint kind of over the top and try not to get it too far on either side. But because it's so see-through, because yellows are so see-through, um, even if I do accidentally paint on the green off to either side, it's probably not going to really show. So yeah, that is a color theory thing, by the way, that the smaller an area a color takes up, the stronger you need it to be for it to show up. And the larger an area, area a color takes up, the more intense the color looks naturally without any interference from you. Uh, the example I always give that people that resonates with people is you buy this pale yellow paint for your bedroom wall and you are like, oh, that's just only barely yellow. And then you go, get home and you put it on the wall and it suddenly looks like the brightest yellow ever. And you're like, what the fuck? Ha what, what did WTF happened? And uh, sorry, F-bomb. It's one of those days. I warned you at the beginning. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and the reason is because on your wall, that color is taking up so broad of an area it is showing showing more. Essentially, your eye picks it up easier. Whereas when it's 
and a tiny little area like this. Yep. <laughs> bleep me out, John. Go and bleep me out in the, uh, bleep me out in the replay. The VOD needs censoring. Man, that may have been the only time. Like, usually when I'm, uh, usually when I stream, guys, I've got my paint club, what I call my paint club brain mode on, which is family friendly. But boy, that one was just like, boom, boom. Sorry. Apologies to all the sensitive ears out there. Anne does not often drop one of those. I'm a very civilized being. Normally, I believe that profanity is most effective when reserved for use in uh, extreme time. There we go. So I'm just painting right over that. And even though it looks like I'm being perfect, guys, uh, it really isn't. It's just that the white is going to catch that yellow and keep it showing up really, really strongly. Yeah, so you got to use a little bit of, of human, like, eyeball theory. I guess it's, it's, it's color theory and it's, like, just biological theory, right? Where your eye is going to notice something, you know, it's going to have a harder time noticing micro details unless they really pop. So Lantern is great for this because it's such an intense, vibrant yellow. You really can't mistake it for anything else. Whereas if I used a paler yellow, the yellow wouldn't carry at all. It would just look white. But we're getting there. We actually have a tartan. I really, really don't like this area now, so. I double don't like it. But one thing the yellow did here is, remember I said the green was too much before. But what the yellow did is, because the yellow only goes over the green, it has covered up part of the green. And so it has essentially knocked back the green and the blue has gotten stronger because I have covered up some of the green. And I call that, my term for this is surface control, is the percentage of area that a color takes up on the figure is going to affect how it appears. And so, especially when you're balancing things like 50-50, it's very easy for your eye to latch onto one and not the other. Um... And that's what was happening here is the blue is dark. It tends to recede from the eye. The green is warmer and lighter. And so it tends to pop out to our eye. And so the green was overwhelming the blue. But now that I've interrupted the green with the yellow, that's it still looks like it's more, it's less blue and more other, but it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Yeah, this is a classic. This is a classic tartan raccoon. One of the, I forget the clan, but it's... Uh, it is based on. I can't get as complicated as tartans are in real life. Um, so, okay, what I'm going to do now is I really want to get rid of these dark lines that I did around the tartan down here. So instead of trying to paint green over those and having to do several layers, I am going to thin down my white more than when I was doing my little tiny stripes. Because I want it to be kind of transparent. I want it to just kind of knock down those dark lines so I can paint green over the top. Sometimes it happens that way, Sean. I'm still not, like, thrilled at the thought of doing this over the entire cape, even though I have now proven that it won't look like total butt. Um, so I may still change to the dwarf. Maybe we'll come back to this model eventually. Maybe we won't. Getting my green mixed up here. Yeah, so surface control, it's a thing. One thing I haven't done, too, is I haven't highlighted the blue um, appreciably, which I can do now to see if I can. Uh, let's grab a little bit of the blue and a little bit of white. Mix up a lighter blue. Now the blue, as it gets lighter, is going to fight a little bit with the green because it's going to get closer to the shade of the green. So I don't want to go too high with my blue. Color I'm looking at is here, this difference. That's this and uh, it's probably about a two to one uh, void blue and white. I'm going to mix up a void blue glaze just in case I need something to knock it down. But yes, I started out hating this model today. I am going to end the day like not hating it, but also not wanting to do like <laughs> more tartan on it. So, uh, yeah, I think she's going to go on the, 
in the box of not to finish at this point. All right, so I thin down and I'm gonna go over this line and kind of knock it out. Lock it, knock it out with a little bit of white. And I'm using my sideways stroke here because I don't need a ton of precision. Now I'll take my green and paint over it. So again, underpainting. I do a lot of underpainting. So painting the green over that um, white line, as you see, knocks it down. You can still see the yellow line in the middle, which is clever of me. I really didn't like it. I, I was thinking I would have to redo the yellow line, but in reality, this seems to be working. There, it's a little better. And I can st still see a little bit of my yellow line on the bottom here in the mud. And I lost a little bit of the vertical here, so I'll have to come back in on this one. I think I'm going to grab... The other thing you could do is mix a little bit of white into the green and put down a light green instead of a white if you wanted to reclaim your vertical here and knock these dark lines out. And then if you feel that you're... Um, if you've gone too pale, you can always put the darker green over the top and recover really well. Actually, if you haven't, if you haven't looked at my Patreon yet, I just put up a video about this. Um, about the highest coverage red, orange, and yellow in uh, Reaper paints. And I also give tr tricks in that video about how to get two coat coverage from pretty much anything. Um, so that's at only the $2 level on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash painting big. I do a lot of nuts and bolts stuff where I talk a lot about paint consistency and the paint chemistry behind some of the colors and why things work the way they do. Chemically speaking, um, as a person who actually created Reaper's paint lines, uh, I actually have this knowledge, which a lot of painters don't, so I take advantage of that. Try to be my own special snowflake. I am just trying to get a little bit more definition on this green stripes over here where they got a little muddy, so I'm taking in a little bit of lighter green. That's pretty good. Now I can go back in. Thank you for the uh, Patreon link, Val. Yeah, if I do, like I said, uh, I started out this stream, Agent Marvel, saying I really did wasn't enjoying this model, so I may not even continue with her. Um, the tartan on the front, I hadn't yet decided if I would even do the tartan on the inner lining. The chances are high I would not. Um, I would keep it on the back, and then I would probably do the tartan in this little area. But weirdly, this would be easier because there are so many deep folds that I could just bury those in shadow and just suggest the pattern. One of the one of the things when you're when you're choosing a freehand uh, design over an area is as long as you have enough flat surface, even if there are deep folds, as long as you have enough flat surface to portray the pattern, like the basics of the pattern clearly to the viewer, you can kind of you know just kind of sketch them in otherwise, and you have all these deep folds here. But the eye will will get it. The eye, if you've done it well, the eye will extrapolate. It'll see the tartan square here, and then it'll just see traces of it on these other folds, but it'll get it. And you don't have to be perfect in, in you know, like, oh, well, this much cloak would disappear into this fold, so I have to put a square here, you know. No, you don't have to be perfect at all. So it actually is, uh, I think, once you've got, like, your basic pattern is easier on something like this than here, because here you have to be perfect all over the place. Because it's a continuous surface. You can get a lot of mileage from folds uh, when it comes to uh, to uh, doing uh, designs. As long as you're using a small repetitive design. Um, I, have a, I have an article on that in my uh, Patreon, actually, too. From one of the first articles I did, I did freehand on the hem of a dwarf's cloak. And uh, it's a very simple repeated pattern. And the reason that it works is that You've got a clear pattern, at least on one part, so even when it disappears into folds, it's easy for the eye to kind of carry that across. So that's kind of a basic rule of, of freehand on uh, areas that are irregular, is make sure that you can at least do, like in here, I would say the clear, the, the components you need to carry this pattern are you need to have at least one of these intersections. So you need to have blue, 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 the lighter square, the yellow stripe in the blue, and the, and the green uh, cross. If you can fit this onto there, then you can carry a plaid pattern across that. 
Like you can you can sell it to the viewer. But you have to have enough room to do that. That's why when you're doing a, a surface that has a lot of folds in it, you have two choices. Either you can do a big, broad, bold pattern that's going to carry even across those folds, like a big stripe, for example. You could do that. Or you can do a micro pattern that you can repeat, obviously, a very small pattern that you can repeat very uh, obviously even on small areas. So like little tiny fleur-de-lis. I could pit, 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 put four tiny little fleur-de-lis on this fold and then do a couple of fleur-de-lis on each of these and I'd be fine. So those are your choices if you're dealing with a heavily folded surface and you're looking for freehand. Um, the thing that you couldn't do on something like this loincloth would be like the thing I did on Aegon, which is a big uh, complicated pattern, which isn't repetitive. So this is a dark sword figure and this is the Targaryen coat of arms. So on this, I needed a cloak that was mostly flat in order to do this. This is not this sort of pattern. I like a coat of arms is nothing you could do on something that had too many big folds. Um, so, you know, it, it's for, for many, many folds on a small surface, you need to do a very, very small repetitive pattern or a big, like straight across, like simple pattern, like a diamond or a stripe. All right, so there we go. So that's looking okay. I did lose my stripe. I'm gonna put my stripe back in. Oh, good! Yay! I'm glad you like your Da Vinci AKT. AKT. I really, um, I, the, the Da Vinci and the Raphael, I, I uh, heartily endorse. Let's see here. I need to put in my lighter green checker down here. Kind of lost it and lost it there. And lost it there, but there's there's muck down here, so I have to kind of work into that too because I was covering up the surface. But yeah, I love my Da Vinci's. I love my. I've even gotten Davy David onto Da Vinci's, although he still likes Windsor Newton Series Sevens, and he uses some Rosemary, and he uses David is kind of a brush mercenary. He goes all over the place, um, and he also likes to try new things. But he works with thicker paint than I do, so that's something, that's a reason that he isn't as into the Da Vinci's. He isn't into the smooth blending and the micro texture and the, um, like, the really thin paint like I am. Like, that's something I do that he is not, his style doesn't embrace that. So it ma your style matters, the thickness of your paint matters, your brush matters, your palette matters. All of these things matter as far as what works for you. Yeah, if you make it big, then it works. And it, it really depends on the surface. You kind of... That's why complicated patterns on shields work out, because shield this shield is usually a big blank surface, so you have the room do what you need to do. All right. Foo! Yay! So that's okay. <laughs> yes, Liquid Nebula. P finishing a big model is such a like it's either a rush or it's an exhaustion rush <laughs> all right i'm gonna restore some of my dust here now in this area since i've reinforced my pattern i wanna i painted over some of my dust though and i like my dust so I want to make sure that I've got my dust on all these like really hurdy areas where there's uh, rips and tears. There's a big pit right in here. That's probably meant to be a rip that I should put darker mucky color in. But I like that I can keep a little bit of my pattern showing through the muck. It shows that I haven't been like totally lazy.
be yeah so lighter dust like if you wanted to do a really light dust effect you would just glaze with this um glaze with driftwood driftwood brown 9162 put a light glaze of brown over the whole thing and it'll imply that you've got a lot of dust buildup over this surface you can still see things through it but it's going to brown it out just a little bit it'll also help the rest of your uh, muck and uh, dirt to blend in and it'll kind of like start knocking down the uh, freehand detail so that's where you got it and then if you like I said if you want a very mucky like this is a little bit more like muck that's starting to dry in the sun and stuff but if you wanted it to be really fresh you'd go with a darker brown at the very bottom where it's caking on and it would take the longest to dry all right well we made it not suck guys but i don't think i want to do it over the rest of the the cloak here so i think we will switch it up i'll have to email uh john and uh justin to uh, give them the the change of topic um but at least i did it and at least it doesn't look terrible and at least i got to explain why and how and what for um so i feel like this was still a pretty successful venture on this um as far as explaining to you guys like why why it was working why it wasn't working you know all that sort of thing so also i got a bunch of white up on her hair so I, apparently i knew that i was just not gonna work on this model again and i was like enough but yeah so that's that 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 is the whys, wherefores, and whats of how you would do, if you were foolish like me and you wanted to do a plaid on the back of a cloak. Um, possibly it would have been easier if I would have gone with black and red instead of the green and the blue. That way, if you're doing half of it as a neutral. Uh, those are some of the, that's some of the most annoying stuff. I mean, okay, what I do is you just have to figure out like where the actual wrappings are. You paint the boot all the same color you maybe put a wash on it. You line around the wrappings. You do some heavy shading underneath the cuffs. Um, and then you usually do the wrappings in a slightly different... I tend to do a very uh, lighter color uh, to make them stand out. So I would probably start maybe with a russet brown boot. Um, and then with the wrappings, I would go for more of a medium to light brown. Maybe a uh, richer polished leather and go up from there. Um, I don't think I will finish the front of the model. Yeah, I mean, but it's, I mean, but it's, it's easy. I mean, it's, it's nothing, it's not rocket science, right? You just paint it all brown, do a wash so that you can find all of your little like things, line around those little ties and do them in a contrasting color. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm done with her, especially cause I like have, I've chipped her on this side. I blurfed her on that side. I'm just pretty much like done with this model. So for my, for my, uh, from my mindset, I'm just like pretty much done. She's done. Stick a fork in her. So instead, we'll deal with, uh, we'll do a dwarf. Because dwarfing. Yeah, it's annoying. I mean, I could even do it now. I could even put a base coat of, like, this uh, shield brown on here if I wanted to. Uh, let me pop a little bit. For the record, uh, Russet Brown, uh, 9199, mixes great into shield brown and is a great shader for it if you don't want to go as dark and as muted as wood grain. So, Russet plus uh, shield or even Russet Plus Driftwood. I like Russet Plus Driftwood a lot. Yeah, I could have painted it like le leggings and, and you know, I could have... The ni I mean, the nice thing about minis that are sculpted like this is that you can certainly paint them as if they're wearing leggings and as if they're wearing, you know, like long sleeves. Um, yeah, and I mean, this was pretty agonizing, Agent Marvel. Over the last couple of sessions, I've actually, like, I actually repainted this entire section. It, it actually was so not working that I that I went, nope, we're trashing it and trying again. So I've, I've hit my uh, my saturation point um, with this model, I guess is what it comes down to, right? Uh, but yeah, let's throw some paint on this. So don't want to go too dark. If you start darker, you're just going to have to line around your little thingies. But I would do just the block in. Be careful when you get close to your skin. If you put on your first coat as kind of a heavy wash to begin with, that can work for you. Because then you'll be able to see where those ties are. So 
So this isn't a like super solid base coat. It had some water in it from my shield brown before doing the weathering effects. So it is going to kind of outline all the little details a little bit as it dries, which I can utilize. There, we'll, do, we'll give her brown boots. Yeah, but I mean, if you want to see me screw something up and then just like decide to like recover from it, Agent Marvel, it's a last session with this model was a very good uh, example of that. I do make mistakes on camera and you know, this, the tartan was a mistake in the making, but uh, I feel like I conquered it in the end. It's just that now I'm not having fun with it. So, <laughs> and, and in my defense, many people have noted that I have not done metallics in ages. I've been doing all NMM because I uh, think it looks better on 28s. So I decided that I would actually do some metallics. And then you guys got to stop complaining. Besides, my NMM or my uh, metallics are going to look a lot like my NMM. So you're, if you're thinking that it's going to be uh, really different, you know, you'll see. You use the same techniques with metallics that you do with NMM to get them to look good. I hear 80. So you've got boots. Boots! Oh, except I missed the top part of that one. Because I needed a little less paint on my brush. So yeah, once this is dried, um, I can see uh, roughly where the ties are going around the surface. I need to... Sometimes uh, sculptors will put some effort into making these ties make sense. Sometimes they will just put some ties on and leave it to your imagination. Uh, Val, you can't figure out... and You're just trying to rush too fast with the NMMs. Like, it took me ages. It took me ages to figure out NMM. I had to really apply myself to learn NMM. So. But the same, you have to think of the same things. You have to think of where your highlight's coming from. You gotta think about where your shadow's gonna be. I mean, you gotta, to make it look good, you gotta think about those things. There are no shortcuts to uh, figuring out lighting. Like, if you want your models to look really good, you gotta figure out lighting eventually. No choice. Never tell yourself you can't. Only tell yourself it's gonna take some time. You will get there. It took me time. It took me a lot of staring at metallic objects until I thought I had isolated a rule set for them and then applying that rule set and seeing where the exceptions were. So brown liner, and I'm gonna line under the cuff. And I'm gonna line around these little thingies. Technically, if you wanted to, you could paint the little straps entirely with brown liner and then just go over that and hit each strap with a lighter color. If you want your straps to be darker, you could just paint over them in brown liner, period. And make your straps be darker than your uh, surrounding boot. It's up to you. But you do need to line them. I keep hearing burbles in my ear. Like Justin is popping in and out of reality. All right, and again, we want to line under this cuff. Some of this isn't quite dry yet. <sighs> so here's a strap here. Just kind of look for the straps. Sometimes it'll be hard to tell the straps from the folds. Just, you know, kind of look at it and see if it ends or if it keeps going. If it keeps going, it's a strap. Technically, this could be a fold, but I decided to treat it like a strap because usually straps crisscross. And 
And you know what? If you paint a fold as a strap or a strap as a fold, probably nobody's going to care. Not if it's as confusing as these boots are. So lining around little straps makes them come out so you can see them. And likewise, your viewer will be able to see them better and appreciate the details of the sculpt, which is the whole point of lining. So there, kind of like that. And right there, it already looks better. Right, BCR, exactly. I think she's probably got a legging, like a, le a legging and then a, then a leather. It's a stylistic thing. I think, quote me if, uh, I, this might be wrong, but I think this was based on Wayne Reynolds' art. So Wayne likes to do very um, stylistic armor, like that sometimes doesn't make a lot of sense, but looks cool. Whereas Izzy, our, you know, Talon, our staff artist, um, far prefers like realistic looking stuff that still looks cool. So it's, it's up to, you know, your, your fantasy artist of choice, right? But Izzy has a costuming background, which is why she's kind of hardcore on the whole, it should make sense. And I don't believe that Wayne has a costuming background. He's just more about, you know, what looks visually interesting. So. Wayne likes anything that makes a model look more dynamic, in my opinion. Because he's, he's about, like, dynamic motion in his artwork. He wants you to say, oh my god, this is an awesome fight scene, and not look too hard at his boots. <laughs> in other words. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's your start, right? And right away, it even looks better now. Now I just have to decide, um, you know, what's going to be lighter and what's going to be darker. So if I decide to go, like lighter with the cuffs the two cuffs and then maybe darker with the straps and bring the boots up kind of somewhere in between uh, but this is i mean this alone makes the model look better it's just now you just need highlights and a little bit more shadows if that makes sense and always put a hard like you usually want a hard shadow in here up against when it comes up against surfaces so i'm just gonna block that in with brown liner and usually I block in a hard shadow behind the boot as well with a brown liner so that it reads as a shadow and you can't really see the color as much. Up against the skin also. Because with a dark blue, you really, your shadows would be like a gray or dark brown. So that heavy shadow there is just fine. Alrighty. Any other questions? While we're we've got a couple more minutes in the stream. So even if I decide to make the straps the same color as the rest of the leather, the fact that I've lined them will set them out so that when I highlight them, they will look different. Scrying Eye comes in at the end. Scrying Eye, say goodbye to the Highlander chick. We've decided to move on. This is her last her last episode. However, if you do care about Tartan, you should go back and watch it because we did actually make the Tartan not suck. 
Yeah, Pendrake. Well, oh, I'm not going to continue with her. She's this, this mini's being shelved after this. But if I were to continue with her, I probably would not do the tartan on the inside. Two reasons. One, I feel it's more than enough to have it on the outside because she's going to be wrapping it around her most of the time because she's going to be cold, as Kurinico pointed out. Um, I put the I would put the tartan on the loincloth, but not the interior. The second reason to not put it on the interior is that this creates a huge um, burst of freehand that distracts from the important thing, which is her face and her motion. So be very careful about where you put freehand and how big it is. I don't mind a little touch down here that just gives us an accent and repeats our pattern from the back. But if I put a huge, huge thing of freehand here, what that tells your eye is look at this. And you don't want somebody looking here. You should be looking here, right? You don't, this is not the important part of the figure at that point. The back of a cape is a fine place to put it because then you're like, this is boring. All I have to look at is cape. So give you something interesting to look at. But when you get to the front, then you're just like, not so much. Hello, goodbye. Sorry, guy. Yeah, paint it black and nobody notices it. Black is the great, like, disguiser. That's why I blocked in that dark shadow back here. It doesn't matter if I don't highlight or, you know, put any any further work into it. If I paint it really close to black, everybody's going to just kind of ignore it and look at the rest of the model. Anytime you don't want somebody to look at something, paint it really dark or black. Like deep shadows like this, where you really can't put anything in it. You really can't do a lot. There wouldn't be a lot of highlighting back here. Just paint it dark. Best painters in the world do that. If it's not important, paint it black or dark. Hmm. Did I miss a strap there? No, I think that's all leather. So, yeah. Any other questions? We are at two after. What? Brown did I use? Oh, I mixed uh, shield brown and russet brown. It's about 50-50. And then driftwood for the highlight. Technically, I could pop a little bit of that into the driftwood to make it blend a little better because I'm having to, you know, kind of do spot blends to make it all work. This is one of my favorite neutral uh, leather recipes, Kernico, is actually to use russet brown and highlight it with driftwood, mixing driftwood into it. But shield plus russet just creates a darker version of that. Um... It's a, it's a nice neutral brown. It's not too orangey. It's not too yellowy. It's kind of soft because the driftwood has a lot of gray in it. So this is a great neutral um, brown. If it gets too light, I would do a wash of russet over it. Actually, let's just do a really quick... Let's do a spot, streaky spot highlight, and then do that. So a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. I need a little bit less... So, do, 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 do. come on, strap. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. So, if I highlight this up, and then I'm like, this has gotten too light. I need to make it get darker again. It's too much. I want a darker brown. This is annoying. Why did I do this? Yada, 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 yada. Okay. So, got a lot of really bright highlights on there. Grab your russet brown. Make it into a glaze. So, one drop of russet brown. Boop. Plus two drops of water. And then assess. It's actually a pretty high coverage brown, so it might need a little bit more. If you want to use it as a wash instead, then you could just mix some brush-on sealer in there. It's pretty strong right now. It is uh, that. And if I'm going to glaze with it, I'm going to just get a little, very little of it on my brush. And I'm just going to paint that right over everything. Do, 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 do. I don't want it to pool. I just want it to cover a little bit over the surface and take down those highlights that got too light. Boom. And then we'll return to our normal dark leathery looking boot. But we have extra highlights. Yeah, this is my favorite dark brown leather recipe. So if it's pooling anywhere, just quick, come in with your brush and kind of suck it out of there so you don't get coffee stains. 
So again, that was underpainting, guys. Technically, that counted as underpainting because I used a thinned white to pop a bunch of highlights, and then I used a glaze to bring it down. So it takes all, it brings all the details out a little bit. Yeah, well, this is the one drop works because it's a glaze. So I loaded a ton of water in here, VCR. So you see how thin it is, right? You see how it's it's pooling. Um, so that's why I was able to use just one drop of paint because I knew I was going to be giving like three drops of water. And that's going to take a while to dry. <laughs> but yeah, so there you go, guys. That at least we got, uh, we learned some stuff on her. And the tartan didn't turn out badly. And you saw lots of like false starts and uh, revamps and corrections and all that kind of thing. If you've been watching over the various uh, times we painted her. So by all means, go back and watch that if you are looking to do your own tartan. But remember, doing it on a 28 millimeter is very difficult. Um, and probably not, you know, for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's not even for me, and I'm pretty courageous. <laughs> so, all right, I think uh, I think we're good. Justin, who out there? Who is out there to raid? Here, I'll turn it over and start. Oh, let's see. Boop. Need to put a little bit more. Boop. There. Boop. Our tiny little lines and our weathering. Let's raid Sky Daddy. Oh, good. What's Sky painting today? She's just chatting. I can't tell what she's doing, actually. It looks like she's just in uh, her civilian clothes, as it were. Oh, okay. Maybe a Q&A or maybe just a chat. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. We will go and raid her. Yeah, exactly, Val. Or make it big if you do. All right, guys. I will see you uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning bright and early. Uh, and I will talk to you later. I hope you have a fantastic Wednesday. Please let us get to the weekend. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you later today for some miniatures then.